Ladies and gents, ladies and gentlemen, let's get your attention. Thank you very much for coming to this session. I'm Riz Khan, I'm your moderator uh, for this. I'm very honored to be back at uh, the St. Gallen Symposium for what I think is now my eighth or ninth year. Um, for a quarter of a century now, the St. Gallen Symposium has held um, the Wings of Excellence Award to encourage young talent around the world to offer their thoughts on key issues that are being discussed uh, at the symposium. So this year, of course, it's the clash of generations. So what happens when you take more than 1,000 competitors from 380 universities from more than 107 countries and ask them to send in their thoughts on this intriguing topic for an essay? Well, a jury, including yours truly here, has the very tough task, very tough task, of trying to find three winners. Uh, judging the top essays. So after finally coming up with three winners this year, we had to decide what to do with them. <laughs> and this is what we did do with them. We are seeing a lot of collaboration between the Eastern and the Western companies, entrepreneurs mixing up, governments negotiating with each other to make sure that, that this, this, this kind of a balancing act where everyone benefits and it is to everyone's interest. There's a generation of people who believe that uh, the ethnic and religious identities are something that's fixed. I think this, and it, it clashes against another generation who believes that uh, the, uh, these identities are something that are fluid. Personally, I'd like to spend part of my time in a clinical capacity working as a doctor and part of my time doing a project, um, working on a business, working in research. Uh, my area of interest is in technology and healthcare, so hopefully doing something related to mobile healthcare. Ladies and gents, a round of applause for the three musketeers. See, they had to work hard for this, so now I'm going to have to sit there and interview them. Actually, I'm going to leave it up to you guys to ask most of the questions, but let me introduce them. You saw them now on the video. Uh, Ashwini Kumar Singh is from the University of Mumbai in India, and he uh, wrote, The Brave Shall Inherit the Earth. Uh, Martin Senevaratne is from the University of Sydney and wrote, Cottage Industry 2.0, Grassroots Technology as a Solution for Youth Unemployment. And Setying Ting of Singapore University wrote, A Generation Plants the Trees in Whose Shade another generation rests. So for the next uh, hour or so, uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but I want you to get a chance to meet the three awardees of the, uh, the Wings of Excellence Award and um, get their thoughts on this topic of a clash of generations. Uh, although keep in mind, you have to be careful about Dubai because what happens in Dubai stays in Dubai. Yeah. So <laughs> having said that, I'm going to start off with a, a single question for each of them, or a couple of questions for each of the guys. Uh, and I'm going to start with Ashwini on uh, on your topic, uh, the brave shall inherit the earth. Now, you obviously, when you say brave, you didn't mean like Native American Indian brave, like high <laughs> or crazy not. horses. Not obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you start off by asking what one event might have captured the, the zeitgeist of each generation's youth. And you touch on Apollo 11 as uh, the incident for baby boomers, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, for Generation X, and you got very generous when it came to your millennials. You actually had two events, 9-11 yes. uh, and the 2008 financial crisis. So in your opinion, what do those events represent when it comes to shaping the psyche of your generation? So uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, I think uh, the Apollo mission uh, was a spectacular 
was a, was a case of spectacular amb ambition. And that is probably what, lack, what is lacking in current environment. 9-11 uh, changed the world for the worse, I would say. You, you had kind of uh, security systems, kind of uh, checks and balances that have reduced individual liberty. Similarly, 2008 recession has pulled us into a state where uh, unemployment is, is a big issue now across the world, and not, not only restricted to the Western, uh, Western universe. So in that sense, I would, what I would say is probably our generation lacks that spectacular ambition. And that is probably, I feel, the responsibility of the leaders of today. Like, I, I would probably want a Barack Obama or someone to come up and say, OK, we'll have a light bulb in every household by 2020. Now, that can be possible. And probably when uh, John F. Kennedy announced that he'll be sending a man to moon, it, it was unheard of. People would have dis uh, d uh, dismissed it as ridiculous. But why not try something like that? Why not commit that kind of resources to some pressing issues like, let's say, energy? Hey, I've got to ask you before I move on to tell us about briefly about the sand goby and the lumpfish, uh, as I think you're the only person who's ever mentioned, well, in fact, it's the only essay I've ever read with sandfish and lump, uh, sand goby. Okay. <laughs> okay, that was a bit of a provocative thought, like just to tease. Uh, probably uh, I, I was here in the morning and uh, I, I heard this, that interesting term about how the baby boomers have declared a war on their own children. And that was just to tease them about that, that how a uh, fish like sand goby ends up killing its own offsprings, whereas the lumpfish sacrifices it itself for the betterment of its own offspring. So, so in that sense, probably this is the right time for both uh, the leaders of tomorrow and the leaders of today to work together and come to consensus, consensus on issues that will define our future. So you think our leaders should be more lumpfish and less sand goby? Yeah, there absolutely. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Martin, cottage industry, youth unemployment, you're not suggesting that young people actually build cottages for people who uh, need housing or anything like <laughs> that? No. Um, seriously, you're on, you focus on the very relevant and rather serious issue of how young people face an even greater challenge uh, in finding work in the coming decades. And what, in a nutshell, is your solution? I should point out, by the way, it was relevant uh, to the judges that you not only highlight the problem, but you also come up with the solution. So what was your, in a nutshell, your solution? So the solution was that, I mean, you look across the world and youth unemployment is on the rise in almost every economy you see, except there's one really glaring exception to that, which is in Silicon Valley, where you see more and more CEOs under the age of 30, even under the age of 20, right, seem to be bucking this trend of youth unemployment. And so the thinking started off with, how can you try and replicate what Silicon Valley is doing in smaller communities outside of this isolated tract of desert land in, in Southern California? Um, and so the, the idea was to try and, and replicate this culture of entrepreneurship elsewhere. And the sort of reasoning was that that is now more possible than ever before because of two reasons. Um, the first was the democratization of, of innovation or of, um, of skills, and the second was the democratization of manufacturing. That is to say, it's becoming more and more possible for this kind of Silicon Valley-esque innovation to happen on a small scale elsewhere in the world. And that might be able to create the kinds of industries and jobs that will give young people a future, give young people somewhere to work. Right, I'm sure we get to revisit that in a minute. Uh, Ying Ting, good to, uh, congratulations to you too, and thanks for uh, being here as well. Now, your essay uh, title put forward, put, puts forward an inter interesting proposition. A generation plants the trees in whose shade another generation rests. I got worried. I was thinking now, you're going to say Isaac Newton wasn't responsible for gravity, <laughs> the guy who planted the tree where the apple fell is. Um, in your essay, you're very candid about how, how Singapore has reached a crossroads, I guess, um, if the generational clash is to be avoided. Because you, you're highlighting how successful Singapore has been in growing into a remarkable nation, uh, but point out that it's now reaching a point of serious inequity when it comes to distribution of wealth in the nation. What do you see as the risk from, from your generational perspective? What do you see as the risk and how might that play out in, in the coming years if it's not addressed? Uh, when I look at the situation in, in, in Singapore, uh, there are two, two main uh, uh, problems that, uh, that, that concerns the youth and uh, can be framed in terms of in, uh, in intergenerational terms. The first is the rising house, uh, housing prices. So as, as we know, uh, most of the homeowners uh, in, in Singapore, or, or for that matter, uh, in a large part of the world, are the elder generations. And, you know, uh, because uh, some of them see this as a way of, uh, as a form of retirement security. So let's say if you have multiple houses, you can use the, 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 the rentals to support your retirement needs. 
But the younger generations have different interests. What we want is to own house. So when, when the prices of the house uh, increases rapidly, what the, elder, uh, what the older generations see is that their net worth has increased tremendously over the past, past decade. For, for the younger generation, it's the other way around. We have to work longer to pay for the mortgage. And the result is that we, are, we have become a slave generation where we have to work to pay for the retirement of, of, uh, of our, uh, the previous generation. And the second problem uh, that uh, concerns Singapore is uh, immigration. Uh, this, the economy in Singapore has done tremendously well uh, because of uh, a variety of reasons. And one of them is uh, it's a flexible labour policy which allows it to import uh, foreign talent to, to supplement its labour pool and also, uh, and also bring in uh, new immigrants. And this, this strategy has worked spectacularly. It has expanded the market size, increased the labour pool, improved the labour mix. And so now you see the economy is doing really well. We are growing at 4-6%, uh, which is really good for, for, for a highly developed economy. But the problem with this is that there is a limit to how much you can do that, in the sense that uh, Singapore is, is a, is a small, small island. And when you try to overcome the issue of, of population aging by bringing in more people, you're essentially postponing the, the problem of aging population to, to the future. Because Aging population is an inevi inevitable fact of modern society. So, so, th this, so we need a sustainable solution to these, uh, to these problems. So basically the brave shall inherit the earth, but the young won't inherit the house. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gents, I want to give you the chance really to talk to um, these three uh, uh, very talented young men whom I had the pleasure of spending a couple of days with in Dubai to make our, our uh, little film. We'll also have a, a longer version of that online uh, in, in the coming week or so. But I want to give you the chance to ask them questions. They've come, come up with some very interesting topics here, covering the overall theme here of the, the symposium, which is a clash of generations. And I want to give you the chance to also ask them uh, questions about the topics they've raised. So please do put up your hands and we'll get uh, the microphones to you as, uh, as, soon as, um, as soon as those hands go up. I don't know if it's so late in the afternoon, everyone's like, I'm not putting my hand up. Um, but anyway, I'm, so I'll carry on asking questions until you guys decide you have something you want to ask them. But so Ashwini, you've got this, this issue now um, of the difference in the generations. Obviously, you know, when, when we got the essays, we didn't know who you were, we didn't know where you were from and so on. And I guess to some degree, what shaped your views of the experiences you've had in your own country, in your own environment? Yeah. Um, when you look at, if you, if you were to compare what you've experienced in India when it comes to this, this uh, generational difference, from what you've seen anywhere else or what you know from anywhere else, is, is this a parallel that, that applies elsewhere in the world? I would say uh, the clash of generation is a, is a contextual ca clash. Like it plays out differently in the Western world and in India it's, a dif in, it's in a different space. Uh, for example, in India it is largely in the political and social space. Uh, uh, I was talking about the other, with the other leaders of tomorrow that uh, in India, uh, the average age, age of, a member of a member of parliament is around 65, whereas the age of the country is 25. So that creates a big dissonance and uh, clash of aspirations. Uh, similarly, in the social space, now uh, it's, it's a known fact that there are these caste-based barriers in India, uh, which uh, kind of shape uh, the thought process and lead to decision-making on various issues like marriage, uh, like how people live, uh, how they commune together. So, and this, this kind of thinking ha is done with. It's, it's probably past its expiry date. And this is where the clash of generation is playing out. So, so in this context, the youth today is experiencing. In this context, the youth is today experiencing that, that kind of uh, shift in their own view, uh, thought process. For example, I would say urbanization as being a potent force in driving this change. So, as cities are being growing, people are integrating more. But then this 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 does not necessarily fit in with the thought process of the older generation. So this is leading to a lot of conflict in many parts of the country. I've got one question here coming up. Just keep your hand nice and clearly, and we'll pass you the microphone. Tell us who you are and, and your affiliation, so we. We have a perspective. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tom again. I'm from Harvard University in the US. Uh, and uh, just by way of getting to know each of you a little bit better uh, so that maybe we can generate some more questions, I was wondering if you could each talk a little bit uh, about your plans uh, for your future careers uh, and ways that you see the work that you uh, pl hope to do uh, potentially addressing some of the issues that each of you raised in your respective essays. Thank, Tom, you. thank you very much. A great question. I'm going to start with uh, Martin on this one and work back around uh, because Martin has the interesting, I mean, my background is medical physiology, so I can relate to the medical side uh, that you, you have. But you also have this technologist in you that's budding to get out. And I gather you want to combine the two. Ideally, yeah. So 
to answer your question, my, my undergrad was in physics and computer science, and now I'm studying medicine. I'm in my final year of med school in Australia. Um, and in the future, I, I, I'd ideally like to combine the two in some way, um, working partially as a doctor and partially in some sort of entre entrepreneurial capacity um, at the sort of intersection between healthcare and technology. So I Martin's probably going to be the guy behind the first Terminator model. So yeah. <laughs> if I don't, I, I, the alternative though is to, is to go into journalism and fly around the world like, don't, like don't this. Don't, <laughs> don't, do um, don't do it. So, I'm yeah, only 25, look at me. Yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of how that, that could start to address some of the issues though, I, it was interesting, we went to Swiss Re yesterday and we heard that of all of the essays that were submitted for the competition, that 1,100 essays, 46% of them were focusing on this youth unemployment sub-question. You know, how do you tackle youth unemployment? And so I, I think, actually, the sort of, uh, and this is what I tried to spell out in my essay, that kind of an entrepreneurial philosophy and trying to generate new ideas, new technologies, new industries can help to tackle what again and again in this symposium has proved to be one of the major intergenerational divides, youth unemployment, the lack of sort of a stable job pipeline down the track for many young people. Um, yeah, so on, an entrepreneurial spirit going forward. <laughs> Ying Ting, of course, uh, you, you know, if, for those of you who haven't read the papers and you can read the essays online, uh, I'll give you the, uh, the online address later, but Ying Ting is, is demanding a new social contract to change the, the interaction uh, between the generations. You had the chance with the Singaporean president here, you could have wrestled him to the ground when the, the, his bodyguards went looking and said, sign this contract now. How are you going to create change with, you, with your idea? Uh, the, the idea of, the, of, the, of this uh, new social contract is based on uh, uh, in, in, uh, East, East Asian proverb. It's the idea that uh, when, when, you, when a generation plants the trees, the trees grow big and it forms the shade that uh, the next generation rests. So the, the key message is that we should see what we have inherited from the previous generation, not as an entitlement, but more as a generosity or a legacy that to be extended and passed down to the subsequent generation. So to do that, there are a few strategies that I propose in my, in my essay. The first is to invest heavily in, in an education system that can prepare our next generation for, for, the, for, for an economy that is increase, increasingly easily disruptive by, by technology development and also globalization. And secondly, also to invest in, a, in, in the infrastructure such that we can make our next generation more productive. And when they are more productive, they, will be more, they, they have more capabilities to support uh, a more dependent population. But Ying Ting, in, in, in terms of the contract, it was a two-way thing as well. How does the younger generation have to meet its obligations? For, for the younger generations, uh, the, the way I look at it is like this. Uh, you, when you go to a, uh, when, you, when you're on a bus, when you see an elderly, you, you stand up and you, you let them take, take your seat because they need it more, more than you. You can look at it from uh, like a moral point of view, like it's, it's, it's a good thing for you to do. But you can also see it from the enlightened self-interest you can, you, you can, from this point of view, you see that when you let go your seat to the elderly, you're e eventually you're establishing a norm. And when you establish this norm, one day I'll grow old. When I'm old, there'll, there'll be a new person, there'll be a younger generation that will, will let me take the seat. So the idea here is that we have to be the change that we want to see. What if we're not traveling on buses when we're old, though? <laughs> <laughs> Ashwini, I want to ask you how, you know, once you become Prime Minister of India, how you're going to uh, make everyone brave. Uh -huh. So, uh, the day probably I become the Prime Minister of India, I'll assume the society will be brave enough. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but to vote, to vote for you. <laughs> yeah. What, what in, terms of, in terms of how you will, I'll get you in just a sec, well, in terms of how you see a solution, I mean, uh, you know, solution to the kind of issues you put forward, uh, what, would be, what skills are you going to use or try to use to, to develop that? Uh, so, uh, I, I would probably digress and give an example of how the young and the old can come together and solve problems. Now, in India, we have this big, big problem of left-wing extremism, which affects one-third of the country. Uh, 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 the Minister of uh, Rural Development, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, came up with this fantastic idea of Prime Minister's Fellows for Rural Development, wherein he hired people from the private sector below the age of 26, people, bankers, consultants, 
to go out there and work in left-wing extremism affected areas which probably don't have access to electricity, water, and solve issues there. And I have friends who are working there and they are changing things. So this is like a potent example of, of a model that could help us in addressing these issues and solving this clash of generations crisis. So you're seeing the evidence of the possibilities yeah, already. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I have a friend who's working in Bihar. Bihar is a poor state from India. He's encouraging their micro-entrepreneurship. People really, uh, he's increasing awareness there. And we are actually seeing tangible success happening there. Mm -hmm. So a combination of talent of the youth and the wisdom of the old is helping us in solving issues. Uh, we had a hand go up there. Let's get your microphone. Put it nice and clearly, and we can pass you the microphone. Thank you. Again, tell us where you're from, your name, and where you're from, please. Anyone else, please get your hands up clearly as well so I can see them now. Thank you, sir, at the back. Hello. There as well. I'm Clement from France. This morning, the first panel was asked, does everybody uh, should have the right to vote? I don't want you all to just answer yes. So yeah. should everybody have the right to vote? And which kind of um, ideas would you suggest to make the voice of the youth more um, powerful? I'm going to go back this way because assuming the country's voted and India voted for Ashwini, so <laughs> should everyone vote? Yes, everyone should vote, and I don't think it should. Uh, uh, like there should be any discrimination in terms of voting rights. Of course, an age limit exists in different parts of the world, and that is fine. And uh, uh, see, see, uh, the question is, how can any country, through any means, restrict someone's right to fundamentally exercise his choice? I mean, on what grounds will you discriminate? On education, on income levels, and if you start somewhere you can go on forever. And uh, probably that is a huge uh, curb on someone's liberty. So I would say everyone as an equal, irrespective of their backgrounds, has a fair right to vote. And in terms of encouraging uh, voting, I think it, it, is, it is probably sh should be a bottom of exercise rather than a top down, because top down has failed in a lot of places. And I think that kind of realization is coming. Like India saw its uh, voting percentages in the phases of election that have completed so far rise up by 12, po 12 point percentage points. That's a huge jump in the span of five years. And I am optimistic about the fact that it will reach around 70 in a, in a few years. Mm. Martin. It's interesting. I, so I come from Australia, a country where it's compulsory to vote. Um, but I think there are some, some interesting questions. I mean, we have a lower limit to the voting age. Should we have an upper limit? Should you pass a certain age? You, that we have a retirement age? Should we have a retirement from voting age? Um, you know, we, we're required to have a license to, to drive. I've heard it being said, should we have a license to vote, that you need to pass a certain basic test in order to be able to vote. Um, you, you, might, you might argue that voting should be the, the, sort of the, the quality or the um, significance of your vote should be tied to your contribution to society. One might argue that as well. I think um, there are... There are a number of different, like, really interesting questions about how we can structure a voting system. The problem is it's very impractical and difficult to actually implement. And what we have almost across the board is a, a minimum voting age um, that's uniform and, unfortunately, it doesn't capture a lot of very politically engaged and intelligent 17-year-olds, but that's just the function of a, of, of, a, of a blanket policy and it's too practically difficult to implement otherwise. And on the other end, should we have a maximum voting age. I mean, there are a lot of 72-year-olds who would argue, you know, if you implemented a 70-year-old voting cap, that that's grossly unfair and they're, they're in their right mind and all sorts, and it would be gross, you know, it, it would be very unpopular. So I think uh, it's, it's a very interesting question, but the practicalities of actually implementing voting reform uh, are difficult. I have to say, if you've ever driven in Florida, you'll know why driving license issues <laughs> come up. <laughs> I don't know how they still get them sometimes, but uh, Yingting. Well, uh, I, I, can, I, I think everyone should have the right to vote. I, I can understand where, where you're coming from. You hope to give the, the youth uh, more, more political clout. But I think it seems to me that uh, in, uh, in today's age, I think the, the main problem now with, uh, is the youth uh, w voter turnout. So I think before that is solved, uh, it's, I think that, that should be the first priority if you want to give uh, the youth more political clout. It's interesting that you mentioned clout because I was having a conversation about clout score with one of the other leaders of tomorrow. Leaders of tomorrow. Um, and they were saying that in some hotels in the US, you get better treatment, better rooms if you have a high clout score. Should you have you know, more voting power if you have a high clout, clout score? score? Interesting. <laughs> um, I'll get to you in just a second. I've got uh, two hands that went up at the back there. There's one gentleman there and then there's one on the other side. I'll come to you as well. I'll try and get to you all, don't worry. First time. Oh. Hang on, I'll come to you. 
Hello, Heinrich Kreuler from Austria. Um, we were speaking about uh, political participation um, and uh, we are used uh, to complain about our political re representatives, in, at least in Europe. I find this everywhere around. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, one of you guys uh, were thinking, were ever thinking about uh, conveying a political career. And it would maybe also be interesting uh, to make a short poll on all the, the leaders of tomorrow in this room, how many of those ever thought about uh, engaging in politics? Okay, that's an interesting one. So well, let's, let's do a leaders of tomorrow hands up vote. Any of the leaders of tomorrow who would be interested in politics? Put your hands up, please. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, well obviously some change needed, well done. Um, Ashwini, I know we talked to you already. You have the political ambitions. Martin, would you ever consider it? Not particularly, no, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. I, I believe that uh, everyone should, uh, at one point of their life, uh, pursue an opportunity to serve the public. But not, not through politics? It can be all other ways. Politics is one, one of the, one one of the ways. ways. Okay, that's an interesting and diplomatic answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gentleman at the back there, there was, uh, I, think, I think it is you, sir, then, yeah. We'll get you the microphone then. Aditya, I'll come to you next. Hi, uh, my name is Matthias. I'm a PhD student at ETH uh, Zurich. And I have a question for Martin. Um, so a question regarding the, um, your proposition of copying the Silicon Valley to other parts. So I completely agree, you're right, that the um, technological conditions for copying the Silicon Valley exist, um, the internet, 3D printing, whatever. However, Silicon Valley is not only a question of technology, but also a question of culture, yeah? um, risk taking, optimism, uh, trust, entrepreneurship, also openness and being crazy to some extent. So my question is, I see that changes in culture are quite difficult to achieve, presumably. How would you promote these changes in a cultural dimension? Yeah, that's a terrific question. Um, I mean, you can give people the tools to innovate. You can give them these MOOC courses where they can study computer science at Stanford. You can give them a 3D printer, but can you just give them the spirit of innovation that they need to use that, no. And I think a lot of the solution to, to trying to culture this, this sort of philosophy of entrepreneur, entrepreneurship um, is, is in the education system and uh, making changes to the education that will, from a very young age, expose people to sort of the, the startup culture that they then will have to go into when, when they find themselves at the end of high school or university lacking a job in a traditional career pathway. You know, I, I'm all for education for the sake of sort of learning how to think, building up knowledge. I studied Latin for eight years myself at school, but perhaps it would have been better instead of learning Latin conjugations to learn, you know, how, how venture capital works or how to register a business in the country. And I, I, I don't think that kind of practical startup knowledge has been built into the edu education system yet. And if you, if you expose people to that from a young age, I think you'll see this innovative culture springing up all over the world. Wasn't it the former US president, Dan Quayle, who said he didn't go to Latin America because he'd never learned to speak Latin? <laughs> I think it was. Um, a microphone to the front, please, the gentleman here, and then the lady at the back will come to you next. Uh, I'm Aditya Ghosh. I'm here as uh, one of the members of the main jury. Uh, you know, clash, uh, the Oxford Dictionary actually defines it as a violent confrontation. I'm wondering if the three of you actually think there is a clash of generations, or is it, are, you, are you more towards a collaborative sort of shade under the tree sort of? <laughs> 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 is it a bump of generations or a clash of civilizations? <laughs> Ashwini? Uh, there, there exists a class of generation, I believe, and uh, you could argue about the degree or the intensity, but I've seen that. I mean, you had amazing protests in India in the last two years about corruption, about uh, women's safety, and that was kind of a manifestation about people being fed up with the current system and wanting change. So there exists a class of, uh, class of ideas. Obviously, it, it is in our interest that it does not take violent proportions and it moves towards constructive dialogue and constructive engagement, and, I, and I'm optimistic about that. You think you're, you're kind of gearing up to say something. Oh, I, I, I mean, I, I, 
personally, I, I tend to uh, interpret the word clash metaphorically. You know, I like metaphors, trees, <laughs> shades. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's, I think the, the way I, I interpret that term is that uh, it's not that my, the, the previous generation wants to you know, wage a war against me. It's, it's, it's more like their, their interests and our interests uh, are placed uh, when, when, when in the context of a political or economical structure is, is, is structured such that uh, we are, uh, their interest is against our interest. You know, that, that's, that's the clash that I'm talking about. What he's saying is there's a 50 shades of clash. <laughs> <laughs> Martin. It's, yeah, it's interesting. We, this was the very first question that the group of 200 leaders of tomorrow were asked when we first arrived. Do you think there really is a clash of generations? And we were asked to go to one side of the room or the other, depending on yes or no. And I'd say about 80% of people said yes, there was a clash, and 20% and the other way. Um, I actually was in the 20% the there is no clash group. Um, I, I think it all comes down to how you define clash. Um, and that's what Aditya is asking you, saying is clash too strong a word? Yeah, I mean, this morning when we heard from Professor Kotlikoff that the, the one generation is at war with their children and they are winning. That really frames it as an aggressive, violent clash. Yes, clash is an appropriate word. But in a lot of other scenarios, you know, we were given the example of, say, um, the old versus young generation's views on pension funding or educational funding or compulsory military service. And in, those are a number of issues in which old and young have divergent views. But is that really a, a clash? Is that not more just a, a, a difference of, of perspective that comes with the natural progression of aging? You know, compulsory military service is going to affect an 18-year-old and not an 80-year-old. It's not that they have a fundamental ideological difference. It's just that they're not affected by this policy. So I'm not sure if this really aggressive rhetoric of there being a clash is necessarily always the case. I think maybe it's just a natural sort of Lady, the lady at the back there, have we got the microphone? No, sorry, at the very back, sorry. You got it there? That's it. Yeah, yeah, no, for you, yeah. Sorry, that's it, thank you. Well, hello. My question won't be that strong, but uh, I'd really like to take this opportunity to congratulate all three of you, and especially Ashwini, we, you made us proud. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, There's your first voter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a competitor, because I'm into political scenario. So here goes my question, because it's, we were discussing so much about class of generation, I would also like to so listen something on class of political generation, because there weren't any visible women participation politicians earlier, and we see a few of them now. So my question is rather personal, would you ever like to have your sister, wife, or maybe girlfriend into politics, and how do you see women into politics? Thank you. I think having a wife who's a politician would be cool and sexy. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't think of possibly finding a better partner to argue, <laughs> engage, I mean... Now, of course, when she becomes prime minister and he's deputy, then it might be different. <laughs> um, there was a hand that went up here. There's, I think the lady there, next. And then there was one, yeah. Oh, hang on, it was, I think this gentleman. I'll come to you. Try and get as many as we can in. Um, hi, I'm Swati. I'm doing my PhD in finance right now. And a lot of us have been discussing this. How much do you believe in the title leaders of tomorrow or leaders of today? Would you rather not be a leader of now and every day? So your view on it. <laughs> I'm always really scared. When we, when we got out of the buses yesterday, I was asked, oh, which way do you go? And I had to lead the group. And I was really scared that I'd lead them in the wrong way and then be called leader of tomorrow, leading the group just completely, completely off kilter. Um, but look, it's, I mean, it, it, I think it's an appropriate title, especially for this year's symposium, because we're trying to frame a clash of generations. And there being a leader of today and a leader of tomorrow cohort, I think, frames that nicely. But uh, you could pick a number of different words that perhaps would sound less arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> Try and get the gentleman there. You had your hand up. You put it, uh, yeah, we'll get your microphone there quickly.
Thank you. My, my name is Charles from France. Uh, I'd like to go back to the political participation uh, issue. Uh, I mean, I think everyone now is aware of the clash of generation thing and the fact that there is an issue by uh, raising the voice of uh, our generation uh, to be heard by the actual leaders of our respective countries. But uh, the question I'd like to ask you now is uh, maybe uh, a second issue related to that, uh, because when we look at the abstention, abstention proportion of our generation, it's quite high. So I think as, I mean, if the title leader was making any sense, uh, your mission would be actually to, to find ways to reach uh, people in our generation, in our respective countries, in our communities that are not actually interested at all. Uh, I was not surprised to see uh, hundreds of hands of people who'd like to be uh, politicians yeah. or involved in politics because I, I mean, I understood there was the rationale of the whole conference. So in this case, it makes sense. But when we get back to our countries, I fear that we have another uh, battle uh, to win and another selection process. So what would be your ideas and advice for everybody in terms of reaching our own people? It's a good point. And actually, if you're going to have a social contract and you're going to have this kind of change, you need to engage what has become, in many cases, a largely apathetic generation when it comes to political involvement, perhaps because of being let down. Yes, uh, certainly. I, I think uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, like, we, we tend to believe that voting is, is the... I think we put too much faith on voting, right? because I think that there's much more than voting that you, uh, you, you can do. Uh, for example, it's, uh, we could uh, the, we could organize ourselves uh, into communities that, that has more that will give us more political clout. You know, we can lobby for changes, and, which is I, I think that that's that's what we can do when we when we get back. Any other thoughts on that from gents? Yeah, I think it, it's like you mentioned, it's an issue of disenchantment, and probably that can be cured by success stories and role models wherein actual cases of uh, political leaders who have grown up from the grassroots and succeeded. And we had a, a flash of something like that in the name of An Arvind Kejriwal, although it seems that he has lost his way, but that was an example wherein you actually saw youth uh, ganging up with him against the establishment to, to, cha to, cha to, to change things. Although you pointed out the average age is 65. Yeah, yeah, and that, yeah. Like, like I previously mentioned, it's a cause of huge dissonance and, dissonance and aspirations. I mean, I wouldn't want uh, someone who's 65 and who's completely out of sync with my own thoughts and uh, ideas to be leading me. And uh, I don't have the alternative. Uh, I wish I had the alternative. And uh, probably people like uh, my friend Lenny there, who, who are young and who are already in the political process, are kind of leading that movement of getting more youth into the political process and not only restricting the, them, to, like he rightly mentioned, to voting, engaging beyond those, uh, that voting day for those five years and participating more actively in the political processes. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't think we come from an, a completely apathetic generation. I just think we need to convert people's interests and their, their concerns into political engagement. I know, Charles, you're from Paris. I just spent six months in Paris, and the French are notoriously, they complain about everything. You would know, right? The problem is they don't necessarily go out and vote and transform that, those complaints into political activism, right? So you need to have role models like you to engage the, the youth. It's not that they don't care, it's just that they, there isn't that connection, I, I don't think, between concern and political engagement. There was a lady who had a hand up in the middle. It wasn't you, it was just the one behind, but... Um Oh, she's gone, okay. Um, uh, that gentleman there who's got his hand up, and then uh, I'll bring it to, where was it, the lady? There, there we go. Uh, congratulations, guys. Thank My you. name is Michael Terrell, and I, uh, I'm actually from the Silicon Valley, so Martin, excited to hear about your essay. <laughs> uh, we'll talk more later, maybe. I had a quick question, and this sort of, if we could step beyond the, the issue of obviously large numbers of our generation struggling to find jobs or get in the job pipeline, um, and actually presume that that those of us in the room and, and the three of you are, are in it. Uh, I know we have a number of leaders of today here who are probably in some way, shape, or form faced with working with and or hiring and or managing uh, folks like us. Uh, probably they wish they're like you. Um, but for, for their sake and also just my own interests, what are one, two, or three things you would tell a leader of today who was your manager about how he or she could get the most out of you and have uh, as fruitful a relationship with you uh, in a work setting as possible. Okay, let's just go straight down the table, a quick line from each of you. Ying Ting? I, I think uh, 
we, we belong to the Twitter generation, so we, we want things to come very fast. And so I, I think in, in a work context, uh, uh, instant feedback is something that uh, the people of our generation might value. Martin? Yeah. Um, I think fr freedom in a workplace is really important, giving you the opportunity to have ideas, innovate, not feel restricted by a very, um, very, a very strict sort of workplace hierarchy. I think that's important. Yeah, even I would probably want more independence and more authority, and I would probably advise him to be more tolerant of failure because with uh, innovation comes also failure. Oh, excellent. Um, the lady there, put your hand up clearly and come to you in a minute. Hang on. We'll try, I'll try and get to all of you. There's a lot of hands going up now, but, which is good. But. Hi, my name is Burcu Özdemir. I'm from um, Turkey. Um, I have a question. Like, I have a feeling that we've been talking about the financial aspects of this gen intergenerational clash or generational clash, clash. We've been talking about pensions, funds, you know, private sector versus public sector, like housing, unemployment, and things like that. I'm wondering, like, you know, what, what is your um, take on about the social and cultural clash that happens between the generations? I think we haven't talked enough about that, but this is something really happening about the values and norms. Like, for example, very basic thing at the like micro level, like that happens in every single household, maybe that elderly people want their kids to take care of them, but the young generation, for example, they don't want it, you know, because they have other life, aspira life aspirations. So, so this cultural and um, at the level of you know, norms and uh, culture, so what do you think about that and how can it be sold? You know, like you cannot bring, you know, technology to solve that apparently. So what is your take on Actually, in this, I mean, it's, it's, it's relevant, of obviously, across Asia, but in India, of course, it's a, it's a cultural thing, too. You have often three generations in a house. Yeah, uh, and uh, she, she, she's right about the fact that the class of generation is also playing, I mentioned it, it's playing out in the social context within the house. I mean, uh, with the explosion of the media, uh, values from the Western world and from the cities have been exported right, in, right into our homes. Now, uh, we, we've, we've traditionally li lived with our parents and grandparents and all, and now we're moving towards nuclear families. Now. Obviously, this is going to create some sort of tension. Now, the parents generally expect f children to stay with them and take care of them, but tomorrow, today's youth probably would want to stay with their wives in another house, irrespective of whether they can afford it or no. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that will obviously create some tension. Other than that, there are also some very important issues like, let's say, honor killings. I mean, uh, if someone's marrying out of the caste, there's the expectation of the family and the society to marry within your own community. Right. And, uh, and uh, that, that's going to be a relic of the bygone era. So how do you manage all these issues? And there are laws, but whether they actually work in practice, that, that remains to be seen. What do you think is the first step to try to change that? I think uh, awareness in education and strict punishment for offenders in serious crimes is extremely important. And, and, and like I previously mentioned, role models here and success stories are, are extremely important as well. Yeah. And I think what, what is working in India's favor is economic growth and urbanization. And I've experienced social barriers and social discrimination and social walls falling apart because of urbanization. When people live in cities, they work together, they, they, li they live together, and they integrate far more better than, let's say, in a rural area. Right. There's a lady who had a hand up there. Just if you can put it up again clearly. Thank you, yeah. My name is Christine Knaps. I'm from Germany, a doctor. A little closer to your mouth, please. Uh, yes, you. and yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, I found it fascinating, all these hands up to maybe uh, be active in politics, but the problem I also had uh, earlier was just to switch it in with my career and with getting children, creating a family and everything. So I was thinking about what you think of the idea of some senior partner like being politically active would just, uh, if societies would, would find it worthy to, to sponsor or help uh, young people to really become active or uh, I know a professor, she helps young um, women who, do, who are doing research to do their, to, to get help in household things because if not with children, they wouldn't have time for their research, you know. And I, because of that, I was thinking if there would be some uh, funds, you know, just uh, encouraging young people and helping them with their daily affairs to switch it in. And the other thing is the mobile, uh, mobility because if you always have to move, the good ones, they always change their jobs, you know, and go throughout the world. How can you be politically active uh, apart from a lobby and Twitter, but right. be politically locally active if you always switch your jobs and move to another place? Okay, so Ying Ting, yeah. this could be part of a social contract that it's built in. I think uh, you raise a very good question about the, like, uh, I think 
we, we, nowadays we see that uh, there are a lot of people who are, are very mobile. They're moving, uh, moving around the world, you know, seeking work and seeking opportunities. And I think it's, uh, in the end, that there's uh, some form of uh, alienation because you, you don't see yourself as being rooted in a particular community. And that, that, is, uh, that is going to be a challenge to, for, for future societies. There was a gentleman who had his hand up in the middle there. Yeah, if you put your hand up, that's it. Thank you. This gentleman is standing. Hello. My name is um, Sadiqi Olua Shagun. I'm from Nigeria. Well, basically, um, congrats once again. But I, I've been looking at a line of discussions. It's all been about entrepreneurship and all that. Basically, if I'm a leader of today in this room and I have a firm, I'm going to be very afraid because um, this um, s somehow we are pushing people towards shifting from the employee mentality to the entrepreneurial. So definitely very soon there are going to be jobs, but nobody wants to fill it. Every employee is thinking about his great dream, his mm. great plan. Nobody wants to work in the long term with a company and stay there for 30 years and um, build a company, build a name, even though necessarily is not the big guy out there. So I feel that if I am a leader of today, of which I still have, uh, maybe I belong to the Generation X, although my age isn't the Generation Y, I feel that there's no emphasis on job loyalty, on right. you sticking to your boss and all that. I right. feel it's more entrepreneurial. A very interesting point you make. All the employers clapping here. Um, <laughs> Martin, this yeah. is actually a, it is a very relevant point because, of course, um, there is uh, there's this huge challenge of the job market for young people, and almost it's almost driving people to entrepreneurship because they don't necessarily see a future with companies. But it's a relevant point for existing companies who say, "Well, how do I how do I know I'm not going to develop this talent and then lose them?" Absolutely, I think it's a great point actually. And I was looking through the list of I looked through the list of leaders of today, and it's very impressive. You see, CEO, CEO, President, CEO. But if you look through the le list of the leaders of tomorrow, it's, it's actually quite similar. You see founder, co-founder, CEO, founder, founder, founder. Everyone has their own enterprise these days, and it's not really sufficient unless you've co-founded three startups and founded a charity on the side and founded a student society. Everyone wants to start something new. And that's fantastic because it inspires innovation, but <laughs> it's not really sustainable because not everyone can found a new company. Like, that's, that's just not really, you know, you don't get natural growth and, and, and uh, you know, scaling of, of those ideas. So I think you need a happy balance, really, between the two. On one hand, yes, you need to foster innovation so you can create new industries. But for sure, you need to value the existing industries that, that are there, because they're there for a reason. And, and presumably, they should create the right kind of opportunities for people to grow and not feel pushed out or whatever. For sure. And I, look, I think the, sort of the clash between entrepreneurship and big business isn't necessarily sort of the two aren't mutually exclusive. Google does a lot of really great work in fostering innovation from within a bigger organization and encouraging people to come up with new ideas that are then acquired by the business and form part of, of an ever-growing Google. So I think the two can potentially go together, but I see your point, it's a very valid one. Okay, a quick comment from Yingting and from Ashwini too. Well, I, I think uh, in general, it, it's always good to have more entrepreneurs in a society because they create the, the jobs, but we have to, uh, we have to be uh, cautious against the, the idea of uh, using like uh, entrepreneurship because we have run out of ideas on how to create jobs for our youth. You know, yeah. like you know, there's no way the, the entrepreneurship becomes like an easy, it is easy solution that you throw. You know, we can't create jobs, so be an entrepreneur. Right. Uh, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of making uh, big corporations of the, the bogeyman or the pro the reason for all our problems. I would probably argue that more and more people with a social bent of mind should join big corporations, in fact, even oil companies, and probably drive them towards more sustainability mm. and infuse our own thought process and our values into them. Change from within. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, lady with the white top, let me put your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you. Thank you. And then I think the last, well, maybe the last one, actually. Martha again. Um, I'm, I thought I would challenge you on the clash between generation. I was in the 80% standing on the other side of the room. And I would also like to think that the, this year's theme uh, grew a bit out of last year's theme. I was here last year as well and really felt that there was a clash of generations. Um, out of the, um, the 15 uh, or actually 17 people we've seen on stage, uh, I'm unfortunately going to diss the, the only woman uh, apart from Nina. Uh, Professor uh, Kuniko uh, Inoguchi, I needed the, the one, who said that we gave the young generation peace. Um, and 
with risk of sounding apathetic and really controversial here, peace for me is a, is a quite fluid concept. Um, by pushing one button, it, dis it disappears tomorrow. Uh, what we are faced with, however, is systemic crisis that we have received by the, the generations ahead of us and or uh, the, the leaders of today, as I, as I would say it. We are actually seeing systemic crisis uh, that, they, that I think that they haven't. Um, what would you say about that? And that's the reason I think that there is a clash of generation because peace and environmental crisis is simply not comparable. Ying Ching? I'm, I'm not sure whether I got, got the point. Uh. Um, well, let's say, yes. really so I, I completely agree with her. I would interpret peace in multiple ways. For example, I think existence of poverty is also antithetical to peace. I mean, India has nearly 30% of our population below the poverty line. They are not experiencing peace. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, I have not got, I have not inherited peace from the older generation. So, what peace are you talking about? So, I completely agree with her. And yeah. you need to have multiple definitions of peace. And absence of more war is not necessarily peace. You mean, you know, one thing, let's, it's because we're literally out of time, but I want to get one line from each of you. Where do you think you'll be 10 years from now? Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope uh, we'll have a bigger shade. A bigger shade, <laughs> bigger tree. Yeah, bigger tree. Martin? Um, somewhere outside of, of Australia. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big country and he's trying um, to escape. Yeah, look, I, I'm not sure. In running my own startup, Somewhere in the world, but you have the you have the, you have the appetite for a startup and entrepreneurship as well. Yeah, yeah. Ashwini, uh, I would repeat my answer what I told you in Dubai. I would probably be leading a financial services company, but I would, I would want to be a member of Parliament from Mumbai. Okay, <laughs> get your votes ready if you if you have the chance. A round of applause for them, please. But Just very, just very quickly as we wrap it up, I want you to know that you know, there's, there was um, um, some slides with some information on them. We didn't put them up because we wanted this flow of conversation, but it's in your participants pack in the Voices of the Leaders of Tomorrow uh, brochure, the booklet you'll see there, and you'll be able to see that document online after the symposium as well. You got kind of an early preview with the, the participants pack. Um, but it's really interesting because a couple of questions were asked, and what was, one of them was, what makes a leader of tomorrow? Uh, it, you know, offering views on what makes a leader and how they perceive themselves. And it's interesting to see what previous generations considered good leaders and what the new generations. I'll leave you to see those graphs uh, to, to get an idea. And also, it was interesting, very interesting to see what the uh, leaders of tomorrow expect when they're looking for a company to work for. And it's funny to see what were the most important things, the priorities. Uh, career prospects come very high, uh, whereas the amount of salary was actually far, far lower, uh, as were company benefits. I mean, they were almost insignificant in choice um, to the new generation. And job security was not important, perhaps illustrating this idea that people are used to fluidity in, in the workplace um, and have got used to the idea of changing jobs regularly. So have a look at that when you get a chance. It's that Voices of the Leaders of Tomorrow. It's got some very interesting information that was put together. Um, don't forget, you can read all the winning essays at um, www.symposium.org slash winners. Do check those out, and uh, you'll see the, the, the winning essays there. Um, I'd also want to actually just get, because for you gents, we've got just a little, uh, um, little gifts, I guess, uh, I should point out. So, Rolf, if I could ask you to perhaps pass them over. Um, thank you so much. So, we have some very, uh, well, we're in Switzerland, so the luxury watches, actually. Very significant luxury watches. So if you actually pass it down, um, oh, you've got to it Pass it down. And, thank you. I thought easier to pass it down if it's easy. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Okay, so can I ask you guys for a picture? Just come up here. Just come up here so we can take a quick picture. Uh, if you come actually to the front, then we can uh, get the photographers. Where, where is easier for you guys? Over there? Gents, if you want to come over this side, please. Actually, sorry, I think uh, this side might be easier. Sorry for this little, little bit of uh, on stage. Just come up to there and we'll get the pictures taken. And this gives me a chance to also express a uh, warm thank you and gratitude to the main jury, particularly its president, uh, Professor Georg von Kro of uh, ETH Zurich, and Professor Gunther Muller-Stevens uh, of the University of St. Gallen. 
A big thanks also to the uh, preliminary uh, jury, the members here, uh, which is composed of around 35 doctoral uh, candidates and PhDs from both the University of St. Gallen and ETH Zurich, uh, who are probably still reciting those essays in their sleep. There was 1,050 of them, so thank you for all that hard work. Also, I'd like to recognize Barbara, Christopher, and Killian, and all the members of the Leaders of Tomorrow team. Um, <laughs> who put a lot of effort in there. And, um, and I have to say, you know, uh, we're just gonna take these pictures here. There we go. Don't know why they want me in there, they're gonna spoil the picture. Thank you. I would also ask, you know, because just to emphasize how hard it was to judge this, um, as, as one of the, the jury members, I can tell you, it really was a long conversation on, you know, what were the winning essays. And of course, they, they were all of excellent quality, but we did have one honorable mention. I just would like to invite Priscilla Bala up from Brazil, uh, who was very, very close also. Priscilla, are you there? Oh, there you are. There you go. All right, well done. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. No, you're okay there. It's good. So, thanks. But just to show, it makes it very hard to, to pick three winners, but so here's our honorable mention as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I'll you know, allow you to, to take your seats downstairs and get comfortable. Thank you. Please, a round of applause for them again.